Thank you. And welcome to today's conference call. All lines will be on listen only until the question and answer session of today's conference. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference call over to our first speaker, Mr. Nick St. Angelo. Sir, you may begin. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today, for participating. Um, in what is the second of four, you know, webinars that we are hosting in partnership with NIEDA. And I specifically want to thank and acknowledge Mark and Cass uh, from NIEDA for um, assisting us and, and actually developing, helping us develop this, and, uh, and also for the speakers that we have today uh, joining us. So um, we think these, you know, webinars are important and um, you know, it complements the entire training thing that we're doing this year, um, culminating, of course, in our workshop that uh, will be in a few weeks in San Diego. So, so we thank you, and um, I'm going to go ahead and, I guess, turn it over to Mark, who is going to start. Thanks, Nick. Um, on behalf of the National Energy Assistance Directors Association, I would also like to thank uh, Nick and St. Angelo and Lauren. Um, the other rest of the staff at ACF for supporting these webinars. These are important to us as well. I think they're great ways to talk about important topics that um, provide key technical support in supporting program integrity in, in LAHEAP. Um, we have three great speakers today. Uh, we'll be starting with Peter Edelman. He's a program analyst for the LAHEAP program. And um, Ms. Edelman serves as a key advisor on the allocation of federal LAHEAP funds, the setting of LAHEAP income eligibility guidelines, and the development of the annual LAHEAP publications. Um, second speaker is Pat Strickland. Pat is a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. Pat received a master's degree in public management from the University of North Carolina. In 2003, he served as the public affairs specialist the tribe and soon moved the Office of Legislative Aid. Um, he's been involved heavily in drafting legislation, providing advisement on policy implementation. He currently serves in the capacity of Department of Energy Manager for the tribe, administering the LAHI program and developing tribal renewable energy projects. Susan Marshall is our final speaker. She's been the LAHI program coordinator for the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services at the Division of Public Assistance since 2008. She's also a member of the LAHEAP Program Integrity Working Group. For her current position, Susan worked for the Tanana Chiefs Conference as a tribal TANF case manager and was responsible for oversight and management of the tribe's heating assistance program. Um, after their presentations, we'll be taking questions. Also, if you have immediate questions, you can also type them in in the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Peter. All right, thank you very much, Mark. First, I'd like to open up with, okay, first, I'd like to open up with the purpose of state tribe agreements and how they, how HHS allocates the funds when state tribe agreements are in place and in the absence of state tribe agreement. Uh, the, the purpose of the state tribe agreement is essentially for the state and the tribe to redistribute their responsibilities in accordance with the, uh, more in accordance with the tribe's need and therefore to uh, give the tribe resources that are commensurate with that redistribution of responsibility. And so doing the agreements are, they are enforceable contracts, so they need to contain uh, certain features that allow uh, allow for the, allow for them to be enforced and also, that, and also for them to be interpreted properly by the state the tribe and by the HHS. Uh, when there's not a state tribe agreement in place, HHS will use counts of eligible households to determine how much LIHEAP funding a tribe will get. Those counts normally come from the decennial census which HHS, for which HHS gets special tabulations from the Census Bureau. Uh, in some cases, uh, they, can be, they can be counts that are documented by the tribe and approved by the state. That's usually when uh, a tribe has when a tribe is 
not appear in the special tag domain act because it's new or because it's not a uh, federally recognized tribe. An agreement then can give a tribe more funds, use other tribes tribe less funds, but it, it can uh, it can give a tribe more funds depending on the, the methodology that the state and the tribe agree to. An agreement will also uh, can also redefine the states and their tribe responsibilities, including the uh, the households that the tribe will serve. Uh, by default, the tribe will serve the eligible American Indian household. Right, the, the tribe will cover just the necessarily serve, but the, the tribe will be responsible for covering the eligible American Indian households in its service area. Um, and the agreement will can also uh, can also define the service area itself. Um, when an agreement will will can uh, uh, adjust that default and call and call for a tribe to uh, to cover the and call for a tribe to cover say American Indian households that are members of that tribe or to cover non-American Indian households uh, that reside in a kind of tech and its reservation or trust land or to cover uh, American Indian households or tribal member households that are outside of this trust plan. So it all depends on what the agreement uh, calls for. Um, an agreement, as I mentioned, is a contract. It's binding. It's also entered free, into freely by the state and the tribe. And in order to be uh, a good and valid contract, it, it needs to be in writing. Uh, agreements are not something that states and tribes have to enter into. They, like I said, they are entered into uh, uh, freely and voluntarily, but it, it, that does occur, encourage states and tribes to enter into such agreements when the uh, tribal needs and responsibilities are more accurately reflected, uh, are more accurately reflected by the terms of the agreement than by the household counts from the decennial census. So, in order to be an enforceable contract, uh, they State and, tribe, state and tribe agreements need to have uh, specific terms that can be referred to in an you know, enforcement context. Um, they uh, they allow state of the tribe and HHS to fully understand the, the responsibilities of each of the parties and the methods by which funding will be allocated. Uh, such terms, uh, the, the, such terms need to include, for example, the duration of the of the agreement, whether it's one year, multiple year, or an indefinite duration, uh, various or the, the necessary program integrity safeguards, in particular those that uh, that ensure that the that the state and the tribe don't serve the same households uh, uh, separately, um, the allocation method. Uh, which I'll get to in more detail in a little bit, um, having to do with the, you know, the three main types of allocation methods, and again, I'll, uh, I'll get that in a little bit more detail later on, and the actual service area uh, and service councils, uh, you know, which I mentioned earlier, the tribal member households, all American Indian households, or any other subset of households that they agree to. Uh, the, when it comes to the allocation methods and service areas, those two should align. So that if the uh, that if the if state and tribe the state or if the tribe say agrees to cover only tribal member households and the state therefore agrees to pick up uh, all other uh, American Indian households on the tribe reservation, then the tribe uh, should get funding from the state, uh, or at least ideally the tribe should get funding from the state that's commensurate with uh, those member household. And in, and in no case should the state and tribe allow any households that are supposed to fall through the cracks, so to speak. Uh, all, all eligible households should at least have the, the prospect of being served by the program. So here, I'll, here I'll give you a little example. Uh, this is based on a fairly real world scenario of how uh, the tribal allocation calculated under these uh, three different methods or options. Uh, in the first option, the state gets, uh, or sorry, the, the tribe and the state agree to 
a fixed amount. Um, in this case, I got an amount of fifty thousand um, dollars. In the second option, the tribe and state agreed to a set percentage of, for example, four hundred seven percent, which amounts to seventy thousand some odd dollars. Uh, the third option, the tribe and state agreed to a uh, a count or a number of eligible households in the tribe, with uh, in this example, it's agreeing to 868 households, and with the state households at a, a little over one three quarters million, that works out to 49 uh, thousandths of a percent and uh, 86 thousand some odd dollars. And under the default method from the uh, from the census, the uh, uh, in this example again, the uh, eligible of a household would be uh, in this example are half, so the percentage is half and the total allocation is half. Um, the, in, all, in all these cases, the agreed upon amount is higher than the default amount. It, again, it doesn't technically have to be that way, though the statute does call, it does mention it. It says um, from or a higher amount that's agreed upon by the uh, state and tribe. Uh, but that's, so this is kind of constructed to show that uh, that agreements usually, usually increase the amount that goes to the tribe. When it comes to determining the, in the previous slide, the, uh, uh, let me go back to this a second. Uh, in the previous slide, the 175 million, that's the state allocation. That, that amount is what we call the state gross allocation. That's the amount that the uh, tribal percentage, when a percentage is all is based off of. That amount, that amount gets calculated through the uh, appropriations process and through the line statute or uh, during the past year, the statute plus the, uh, the, the Appropriations Act. Uh, the process for calculating the state's amount goes through this flow chart up here. It starts, and I'm using federal fiscal year 2012 as an example. It starts with the appropriation. In uh, 2012, it was 3.472 billion. From there, HHS has the uh, option to set aside as much as $27 million for leveraging incentive and residential energy assistance talent programs. Um, in 2012, it's set aside $26.9 million. So that's a little less than $3.5 billion. Um, from that, uh, HHS also has the option to set aside uh, up to uh, up to a certain amount of training and technical assistance uh, up until 2012, that amount was uh, $300,000 at least for, uh, except for quite a, some years way back in, in the early years of the program. Um, up, and then in 2012 and also 2013, the Appropriations Act allowed uh, HHS to set aside as much as approximately $3 million. After that set aside, the, the remainder goes to all the grant, all the grantees, state, tribes, and territories. In this case, it's uh, $3.442 billion. From there, the territories get their share. It's uh, about 1,300 sort of percent total. Um, after that, after that set aside, the, uh, the rest gets distributed then to the states uh, and the tribes together in what are called the state growth amounts. Um, the, uh, the 175 million that I mentioned in the last slide that would, that would fall out of uh, uh, this amount and, and the amount in this box here. The that distribution goes through what's uh, famously known as the Lyme formula. Actually, two formulas. I'll get to those in the next in the next slide. Once uh, one of those formulas uh, takes back, well, two two plus a hybrid formula. Once the appropriate formula takes effect, the tribes set aside then get then get taken from the state growth set aside based on either the agreement or the uh, eligible household count. And in the case of 2012, that was just a error on it. That was 38.4 million went to the tribes, and then the remainder of just under 3.4 billion went to the state. And that's the amount that actually went to the state. The formulas that I mentioned, first of all, they apply only to what's called the regular block grant. Um, there are there's another funding stream called emergency contingency, which is, is a whole other animal. Um, and the regular block grant has two different formulas that take effect where, based on whether the appropriation is below 
1.975 billion or at or above 1.975 billion. Below 1.975 billion, the department, the, what's called the old formula takes effect. That means that the state's gross amounts, again, that's before the set aside for the tribe, the state's gross amounts are based on the raptor percentages that are based on the 1984 appropriations that were actually, uh, I think I'm sorry, 1981 appropriations that were, uh, that have been basically enshrined into law since then. If the amount equal to exceeds 1.975 billion, then the new formula takes effect. The new formula uh, considers uh, state low income household home energy expenditure shares and uh, various what are called hold harmless percentage or hold harmless levels, which uh, are guaranteed that, no, that states don't see excessive decreases in the amounts of funding that they otherwise would have gotten. Um, now, for the past five years, including this one, a hybrid of the old new formulas was put into effect by the Appropriations Act. And that's, this is, I can go into a lot more detail about this, uh, but that's really important for another time. The tribal allocations are then based on the state's growth allocation. Uh, and it, that, comes, that comes through these formulas. Um, and they are always, they always go to the tribe based on the states in which the tribes are located. So when it comes to determining the, the tribe's allocations, uh, this is where the state tribe agreement kind of fit in the priority list. HHS will start with determining the tribe's or the methodology for the tribe's allocations. HHS will start with determining the state tribe agreement. Whatever those terms are, HHS will use. If there's no state tribe agreement, then tribes will then the, the amount that goes to the amount to go to each tribe again based on the, the states in which the tribes are located. Uh, then each tribal, the amount that goes to each tribal will be based on the like each eligible household. Uh, as it up here is from the decennial census, could technically also be from the uh, like eligible households that are documented by the tribe. And I'll give a little bit more detail about documentation in the next slide. Documentation, if a tribe wants, well, a tribe either justifies and wants to or needs to document its household, uh, then it needs to put in a description of, uh, it, need, it needs to go through the process shown in this slide, basically. Uh, it needs to describe the Wadi, sorry, the tribe's Wadi serve area and population. Uh, it needs to indicate how, or the source of the data and methodology that it's used to generate the counts of eligible households and the final count itself. Uh, the eligible households would be the, uh, the households that are at or below the, uh, the federal income maximum, uh, 50% state median income, 150% of federal poverty guidelines, or, household, or households that are I mean, categorically eligible under a variety of programs that are listed in the Wyoming statute, but not double counts, of course. Um, the, uh, this, once that documentation takes place, the state has to get that documentation approved. Or, sorry, the tribe has to get that documentation approved by the state and then uh, send over to HHS for review, and then HHS will use that figure. But again, this only takes place when there is no state tribe agreement and when the there is when there's no uh, decennial census figures or, or the tribe doesn't when the case when there's no decennial census for the tribe. When there is a state tribe agreement, and this is essentially a recap of what I mentioned earlier, when there is a state tribe agreement, then HHS goes to the terms of that agreement. Uh, under, again, under the default, it's based on the uh, decennial census or other or documented figures. Under an agreement, it's based on whatever, I say higher up here, could technically be lower, but uh, usually it is higher. Um, it's based on, uh, whatever method the agreement calls for. And as I mentioned earlier, it could be a set dollar amount. Um, and I'll get into exactly how many how many tribes or what percentage of tribes use these different types of methods in a couple slides. <clears throat> could be an agreed upon percentage or agreed upon eligible household number, which then gets turned into a percentage based on a base eligible household number. Could even be a combination of those. Uh, any of those three, um, uh, some in years past, uh, some tribes have used have 
done at an agreement with the state for a fixed dollar amount and a, uh, a household a household number. There could be other permutations. There could be a, a guaranteed minimum, which is the case, for example, with Oklahoma's price. There are guaranteed minimum of $4,000, but beyond $4,000 is uh, based on either agreed upon the household number or agreed upon or be based on any other method that the state can provide these systems. Uh, whatever the method the, the whatever method the state tries to use, that should align with the uh, the household that the tribe is responsible for serving. And as I mentioned before, this, this that could be the uh, the tribal member household, sorry, all American Indian households that reside on the on the tribe land, which is uh, essentially the default, unless the state agrees otherwise, um, or it could be something something else that the state and tribe agree to. And again, whatever whatever the state and tribe don't agree to, the state will then assume responsibility for. Um, okay, so when it comes to what how the state and tribe distributed uh, their funds in FY12. Almost 90% of the tribes use some sort of state tribe agreement. Um, uh, though about 40% of, of all tribes use agreements based on eligible household numbers. Another 47% based on uh, sorry, based on agreed upon eligible household number. Another 40% based on agreed upon percentage, and almost 7% based on and agreed upon uh, that dollar amount. Uh, and then there were the, the, with the guaranteed minima, there were those of the tribes that were in Oklahoma where they had a guaranteed minimum of, of $4,000. Um, in the past, uh, some tribes have gotten a combination. Uh, New York's tribes up until three years ago uh, got a, a set dollar amount and, a, and a, an agreed upon household number based percentage. So that, co that covers. Uh, that covers state tribe agreements from the perspective of the line of allocation formula. And I will then turn it over to Patrick Strickland. Thanks, Peter. Uh, for those who joined the webinar after it began, again, my name is Patrick Strickland, and I manage the Department of Energy for the Lumbee Tribe in North Carolina. Agreements to the Lumbee Tribe are important because it ensures that we are able to maintain our sovereignty through negotiation. Um, tribal agreements are eligible. Tribal governments are eligible to administer LAHIP as a direct grantee based on an allocation from the federal formula or either a method of negotiating terms with its state. Um, as Peter previously outlined, tribes and states use various types of agreements to determine the block grant allocation. Um, Lumbee chose not to use um, tribal membership roll data because we provide LAHIP assistance to all American Indians in our tribal territory service area, which consists of four counties in southeastern North Carolina, just not to uh, Lumbee tribally enrolled members. Lumbee negotiated with the state of North Carolina to determine its application, its allocation based on the percentage of eligible American Indian households in the tribal service area using those individual county statistics versus the total number of households eligible across the state. Um, I've listed the negotiated 1.778431%. To give you an idea of the breakdown in FY 2012, the total block grant allocation for North Carolina was 83,011,536, and the travel allocation um, from that was 1,476,191. Um, a benefit of an agreement allows the two entities to include additional provisions that are beneficial to implementing their individual program. Uh, the Olympia Agreement determines we are responsible in fulfilling the requirements in developing and implementing the tribal plan specific to the needs of our tribal applicants. Uh, we um, assume the fiscal responsibility for administering um, LAHEAP and we take the necessary steps to ensure that our tribal recipients are not receiving benefits from both the state and the tribe. Um, prior to a state of tribal agreement, the state was assuming the responsibility of making determination of who was American Indian by word of mouth. Uh, for example, if a tribal recipient had received the maximum amount of services from our office, they would also apply with the local DSS for the same services and by word of mouth would say they were not tribal and without question would receive the additional services. 
uh, which would get into the, the double dipping aspect. Um, this all agreement also gave the tribe all authority in determining who is tribal and who was not. Um, as part of this agreement and keeping program integrity in mind, we began a shared data process between the tribe and the state that benefits both entities. Um, the tribe agreed to process its tribal applicants on the state processing system that all local DSS offices use, and in return, the state allowed us access to the, their online verification system. At the state's benefit, by the tribe processing on the state system, it elim eliminates duplicate applicants and once a tribal applicant is processed for LAHEAP services by the tribe, other DSS entities have access to this information and will now refer them back to the tribe rather than administer additional services. An additional benefit to the tribe is having no fiscal interest in the upkeep of the system. The state provides all consultation, technical assistance, and maintenance for all users. Tribes negotiated interest allows access to the online verification system, providing access to income verification specifically for the unemployed. Um, before we had access to the income verification system, we had a significant number of applicants um, with unemployed status, but now with the verification we were able to see if they have or have not paid the quarterly income taxes. OLV also allows us to verify um, Social Security income, Social Security numbers, and date of birth, but more so the biggest benefit has been detecting income fraud abuse. Uh, when it comes to um, agreement negotiating, our tribal constitution is specific in delegating the tribal chairman with all authority to negotiate contracts and agreements. And as a department manager, I'm his designee to negotiate with the tribal agreement, not with the state's designee. The only issue that I faced and, and you know, faced in negotiating the process was timing. Uh, the state fiscal year um, administering FY 2013 funds uh, will begin this July uh, 1st. And the tribe is on a federal fiscal year, and we begin spending FY 2014 funds um, in October. Uh, we have found it to be easier to negotiate after the state begins its fiscal year after July 1, um, prior to the tribe's fiscal year of October 1 and we are mutually agreed to revisit the agreement on a three-year basis. Now that ends my portion of the webinar, and I've listed my contact information for those who may have additional questions regarding tribal agreements. And with anything, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thanks, Patrick. Um, my name is Susan Marshall, and as you may recall, I am the program coordinator here in the state of Alaska. And it looks like we're paging up through my slides to get to the beginning of them. Um, I administer the heating assistance program here in the state along with 13 tribes or native organizations. And together, we represent the whole state of Alaska. On the slide that you're seeing on your screens now, it lists the 13 entities that also serve here in the state. And you'll notice that some of them with the asterisk on them are individual tribes, where the others are um, tribal organizations that represent a number of tribes within their service territory. The 13 tribes and native organizations serve approximately 41% of the state of Alaska. Tribes receive direct funding from ACF to administer LIHEAP. They also receive grants from the state to administer the Alaska Affordable Heating Program, commonly known as ACAP. The state program mirrors LIHEAP with the only difference being that ACAP was created to serve households with incomes between 151 and 225 percent of Alaska's federal poverty income guidelines. So we do work with the tribes uh, for both of these programs, LIHEAP and ACAP, and since ACAP was set up to mirror LIHEAP, it makes it much easier for all of us that are administering. Uh, the state and, native, excuse me, state and native organizations have developed a positive working relationship, and we do communicate on a rather frequent basis amongst ourselves. What's the importance of having a memorandum of agreement? Well, I think probably, once again, to drive home the point is it reduces the chances of duplication of benefits, uh, families applying with both entities. It provides a framework and outlines which agency or organization is serving residents in a particular community, and it identifies the duties of each entity. Here in Alaska, some tribes 
serve all residents within a community. Some tribes or native organizations serve only Alaska Natives and American Indians in those communities. And we are able to program our computer system here at the state to essentially reject applicants that are served by the tribes. Uh, what happens is if we get an application for one of those clients, the client receives a denial notice and the notice informs them where we have mailed their application and we direct them to the appropriate tribe. At the same time, a cover letter is generated to go with the application to the appropriate tribe. So the application is forwarded to the tribe and a notice is sent to the individual letting them know where their application has been forwarded. In the case of where we have um, more than one person in the household, and it may be a mixed household, we talk to one another to make sure there is not a duplication. Other reasons that we have a memorandum of agreement with the tribes and benefits, uh, the tribes actually have a better understanding of their members' needs and situations. Alaska is a rather large state. We're spread out, and there isn't a lot of a road system. So the tribal staff um, and villages assist with completing paperwork, obtaining documentation, things along that line. Um, they, if there's an emergency, they can verify emergencies, which is very helpful. Tribal staff can assist when there is a language barrier. Um, here in Alaska, there are some areas where Yupik and other native language, languages are still spoken, and it is most useful for the for us to have the tribes working with individuals who speak their own language. And tribes are aware of the environmental weather or other uh, weather conditions impacting households and their winter heating needs. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a large state and uh, the climate can be so different from one area to another that it really is best to have people working with individuals in their own geographic area. Having us work together also guarantees that more vulnerable residents are being identified and assisted. An example of this was three years ago, Bristol Bay Native Association began administering the program, and once they began administering the program, we saw a large increase in the number of households participating from their area, so we reevaluated their percentage. One of the things that they've been very successful at is outreach, and when they do outreach for heating assistance, they do it through all the programs that they offer. So we are flexible in that if a, a large uh, increases seen in an area, we will reevaluate percentages um, sooner than the agreement is up. The way the allocations work in Alaska is uh, we base it upon basically uh, a comparable benefit. If an individual tribe would like a tribal organization to administer their LIHEAP, the tribe must complete a resolution indicating that they want said tribal organization to administer the program for their members. Uh, resolutions are submitted with the tribe's LIHEAP plan to ACF. The resolutions, along with the memorandum of agreement, uh, delineate who is being served by each entity. Some native organizations serve all residents, as I would mentioned, within a community, and some serve just targeted populations. And I'll be getting to a slide in, in a few minutes. You'll be able to see how we delineate that. The resolutions and MOAs are sent to D.C. to support the percentage of funding ACF distributes to each administrator in the state. And allocations rarely change unless an individual tribe decides to have someone else administer their program or the percentages are reviewed. And here in Alaska, our percentages were last reviewed in 2005, and we're now in the process of doing that again. Um, our allocations, as I mentioned, are based upon a comparable benefit. And what this means is that we look at how much money the tribes would have had to pay in benefits had the states served those clients. So each tribe provides a download of their cases when we when we do do the reevaluation. And we don't ask for all the pertinent um, very specific information as far as names. We don't want names. We don't want Social Security numbers. We only ask for case number, community, fuel type, household income level, dwelling size and type, um, and whether or not there's an elder, disabled, or child living in the household. Those are the factors that we consider here at the state when determining our benefits. And the formula basically reads, we start with our community heating points, and those are developed um, to reflect community weather and heating costs in the various different communities across the state. Uh, that's multiplied by a dwelling factor, multiplied by an income factor, and then if there is a a uh, member of the vulnerable population, meaning elder, disabled, or child under the age of six, the household gets an additional point. And then our points are multiplied by a dollar amount that is um, told to us in statute. And that changes from year to year. 
So basically, here's a few examples. So in the first example, a household lives in Anchorage. They heat with natural gas, so they're starting off with four community heating points. They live in a three-bedroom home, so the multiplier is 1.3. Their um, household income size is between 101 and 125 percent of poverty, so the multiplier, the income factor, is 0.6. If you follow that down, they end up with 3.12 points. Uh, they have no vulnerable members living in their household. You do need a minimum of two points. They have over two points, so they would get three points, and then that would be multiplied out by the $150 per point for a total benefit of $450. The tribes do not have to follow this formula, but as I said, we work their cases as if they were our clients to, to make sure that their clients are getting a comparable benefit to what the state would be giving them. The next slide is a, is a little snippet of our community listing and community heating points, and this is how we can determine who is serving which community. This is programmed into our computer system as well as these lists are available to all of our workers and anyone who requests them. So if you look at this example in the, in the case of Akiak, um, there is an asterisk in front of KANA, and what this means is that uh, Kodiak Area Native Association will serve all Alaska Natives and American Indians in their service area, and the state of Alaska will serve all of the residents. And that's in comparison to the next one down, Akiachak, in which case there's a zero in front of it, and that indicates that the tribes serve all residents regardless of ethnicity in that community. If if you go down to Alexander Creek, you'll see there is nothing, and that means that the state is serving that community. So it's um, a way of helping everybody determine who they should be sending clients to and delineates what's in our memorandum of agreement with each of the tribes. So using the data um, that, that we get from reworking each tribal's caseload benefit, uh, we use that to determine what the payment would be under the state rules. All the cases are added up by community. Each community's total is compared to the state total to get a percentage per community. And in the case of the tribes that are serving the total community, then they would get the total um, percentage of um, money for that community. If more than one group administers in a community, the community's percentage is prorated based upon the number of households served. And then our memorandum of agreement spells out the percentage of the the state served by the specific tribal organization. And we do have a copy of our memorandum of agreement on the LIHEAP Clearinghouse website if anyone would like to take a look at that. The other, the other point I'd like to mention is that um, we do look at several years' worth of data. While we're just doing that data dump with the comparable benefit, we will go back and see how many households were served in previous years to make sure that that's actually um, an adequate number and that it's not just a, an off year where somebody, um, maybe not as many people applied or maybe there was a huge number of people applied. We try to actually look at the average after we've worked out all of this. Um, the data we share. Because our tribes also administer our state-funded higher income program, we work together on a frequent basis. Um, we have quarterly telephone calls and meetings to discuss state and federal funding, program changes, outreach challenges, and best practices. In fact, we just had an in-face um, meeting last week or the week before at Cook Inlet Tribal Council in Anchorage, and we're trying to get together once a year for those reasons as well. Um, every October, the tribes provide the state with an annual summary of households served and dollars awarded by community. These figures are used to report our statistics to our legislators, state departments, native organizations, gov governor's office, and anyone else who asks for them. So I do put together a big spreadsheet based upon their, their statistics as well as the state's. Um, tribes have also been offered read-only access to the state's eligibility information system so they can verify benefits and don't have to pen for that information. And that particular option does require a separate and different memorandum of agreement. And information about households we each served, uh, we share to prevent households from receiving duplicate benefits, as I'd mentioned earlier. Um, Alaska is presently in the process of reviewing our percentages, and what we're going to do is we will look at the census figures provided by ACF to determine the number of potential households the tribe will serve. 
And then we also have to look at will they serve just their own members or a whole geographic region. If it's going to be a whole geographic re region, we'll look at the census numbers for that region. We're going to run each tribe's databases, as I described in depth already, and um, use that as a comparable benefit. So, for instance, if um, tribe X, Y, and Z awarded $300,000 in benefits uh, to folks in their tribal area, that would be compared to the total amount that would be paid by the state and all the tribal areas together, and they would be given a percentage based upon um, their dollars compared to the total statewide dollars. The other things that we're going to do um, is we're going to take a look at um, ad admin costs. And um, by using the comparable benefit the way we do, some of our tribal organizations who are in the more southern parts of the state uh, will not receive as much in admin as some of the higher areas because the higher areas have higher heating costs. And as we all know, admin costs are based upon a percentage of your overall grant. So um, where are we going to begin? Well, it does require the cooperation of all the entities that administer in the state. In order to compare a part to the whole, we need to have all the parts reporting. So we are asking everybody at the end of 2013 to send us a new data download. We also are developing new community heating points that are going out through a reg change right now. We'll be using those new community heating points and that new data to do the comparable benefit calculation. Um, after we have that done, we'll distribute the information to each of the respective tribes along with the census information, and then we'll have a teleconference where we're going to review the stats, discuss potential future growth, um, the admin costs um, situation that I mentioned, and then we will all come to agreement on new percentages and the new memorand memorandum of agreements will be put in place for FY 2015. And that's pretty much how we do things here in Alaska. And if anyone has any questions, um, here's my name and my telephone number and my email address. I'd be more than happy to follow up with anybody. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Mark Wolf to finish up. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, our next slide provides a summary of key provisions and state tribal agreements that were discussed during today's webinar. Essentially, it's a checklist, and um, these are key areas to um, be aware of when developing these agreements. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers. Um, we are now going to uh, have a discussion uh, and open it up to questions. Tanya, uh, the operator, operative, will now provide instructions for asking questions for the uh, session. Thank you. At this time, we are ready for the question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1. You will be prompted to pre-record your first and last name. To withdraw your question, please press star 2. Once again, to ask a question, please press star 1. One moment. First question, Philip Lopinis, I think that's what you said, your line is open. Hello, I was wondering if it was possible to get a copy of today's um, presentation. Yes, the presentation, this is Cassandra with NIEDA. The presentation will be available on uh, the LIHEAP website, and we will also be uh, emailing it out. Thank you. Our next question, Sheila Kibble, your line is open. Thank you. Um, in attending past conferences through um, for LIHEAP um, and discussing and collaborating with some different tribes, um, what I've learned that some of the tribes and states do in different states is um, if a tribal member goes to a Department of Human Services or a state department, and the state is aware that the applicant is a tribal member, they have the right to not serve that family and refer them to the tribe. Um, I would like to ask for a clarification if the tribe, or I'm sorry, if the state has an obligation to serve that household. Uh, 
Um, I can answer that question for Alaska. Here in Alaska, um, we would not serve that household because um, of the memorandum of agreement. The mem memorandum of agreement has already spelled out who will serve each client, okay. and the funding was distributed based upon that memorandum of agreement. Okay, and are you with a state or tribe? I am with the state of Alaska. Okay. Um, let me just, can I, if I could, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how we operate our program. Um, say our maximum yearly benefit for LIHEAP is $500, and a tribal member goes to the state and gets $250. They could then come to the tribal LIHEAP program and get the other $250, um, and that's the way it's currently operating. So I just didn't know if it, if states were going to be changing that, but it sounds like in your memorandum of agreement that you've spelled that out. So it kind of answers the question. Um, from the tribal from the tribal aspect, we the allocation is made to the state, and you know then we pull our funding from that. So it's basically uh, we're sharing the same bucket, so to speak. So that is why we serve the tribal households and the state. Will serve non-tribal households. Okay. It, it comes out of the same pot, basically. So that's why we don't serve the same household. Um, Susan had stated that for for the mixed households, um, she mentioned that the state communicates with the tribes to ensure that there's no no duplication of services. Uh, the way Lumbee handles that, is, you know, in, in that scenario, is we negotiated with the state that to be considered an American Indian household there must be an American Indian 18 years of age or older. Okay. If not, then it's not considered an American Indian household and local DSSs will have to be responsible to serve that household. But we do not serve the same households at all. Okay, great. It sounds like, and you're from another tribe? Uh, yes, Lumbee Tribe in North Carolina. Okay. It sounds like a lot of the tribes are doing that. With, okay. And it makes sense because, like you said, the state has their funding deducted so that our tribe could receive the funds. So it does make sense. Yeah, it's the same funding, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next Good. question, Andrew, your line is open. Hi, uh, I'm a Tanaska Nation, and we're we're um, really interested in getting access to our state's online uh, verification. Um, so I'm just wondering if somebody could sort of speak to how that how that process would look like and getting that memorandum of agreement going. Um, that, that is exactly how we process ours, and I wouldn't say it was a hard task or it was an easy task. It was just something that was uncharted territory when I approached the state. But it really set in hard when HHS kicked off with their program integrity plan with the model plan. That was that was the one way that we were sure that we would not um, duplicate services. So basically, the program integrity you know helped me out with that aspect, and and it has really worked since then. So okay, from that point of view. I got a question. I'm with Andrew. My name is Debbie Francis, uh, also from Scott Nation. Um, we, uh, with Topscot Nation, we get direct funding from the federal government, so we're not state agreement at all. But to access the state, like, um, uh, what would you call it, um, ACES, you would still have to enter into a memorandum of agreement with the state for that piece? Yes, because that is a state um, operated database. They have their security issues. That, um, I, actually, when, when we went through the OLV, the state did not have to provide us access, but because um, in the memorandum of agreement, we actually had to go to our state offices and go through their security training that is required by their by the state legislature. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Our next question, Somia Britt, your line is open. Hi, um, I was just wondering from HHS, what are the expectations surrounding the time frame in which we should renew it? Should we wait until the questions asked about the percentage, or is there kind of like um, some sort of guidance as to how frequently we should renew these tribal agreements? Um, hi, this is Nick Angelo. Um, you know, I'd encourage you to be proactive, um, you know, on the part of the tribe to um, initiate discussions with the state, particularly when there are changes. Um, how frequently you do it, um, I would say, you know, well, two things. One would be, we've seen that at least once a, once a year, depending on how the agreements are, if they are renewed each year, uh, then I think that's certainly uh, the right time. Um, or, you know, when you 
when there's more information that perhaps you've got documented that you want to share with the state that sort of uh, new data or whatever that may have come up that you feel like would influence um, a future agreement, uh, then you should do it at that time. But if, you're, if your agreements are uh, renewable each year, I think that's the opportunity at which, um, at the very least, you'd want to uh, uh, talk with the state uh, on that matter, you know, in terms of frequency. Thank you. Our next question, Kathy Crosco, your line is open. Hi, I was wondering, um, ultimately, what entity is responsible for ensuring program integrity safeguards are being followed? I know some uh, mentioned that there are shared databases, but if it's in the agreement that, say, the tribe would check with the local agency that are kind of co-covering the area, um, how does, I guess, we struggle with, you know, whose responsibility it is um, to make sure the safeguards actually being put into place and, and uh, information is double checked. Before we oh, the information. Uh, this is Nick St. Angelo, I guess I'll answer. Um, you know, every grantee, whether it's a state or a tribe, is responsible um, for program integrity in their individual programs. Um, I think what you're asking, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is, is that you, there's a reliance on a system that the state has, um, and so that the tribe sort of presupposes that there's some verification involved in that system already. Is that sort of what you're alluding to? Um, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, again, it, it doesn't, it, by, by utilizing the information that the state has um, and is not, you know, perhaps the only thing that you do, um, but uh, there's a level of confidence that obviously you would have when using a system that has some verification in it as well, where a lot of states, for example, use categorical eligibility uh, and uh, would rely on the information from, you know, the SNAP program, for example, uh, to qualify someone who um, receives SNAP uh, for the LIGE program. It's kind of a similar situation, so I think it's a mixed, it's a mixed answer. It's that the tribe is really responsible ultimately for its own program integrity, um, and your usage of the information that a state provides is one of those factors. Okay, thank you. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star one. One moment. There are no further questions. Uh, pardon me for saying that. I believe we have a question uh, for the question and answers window from Sylvia Britt for Susan Marshall. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, sorry. Um, she asked uh, Susan in particular. Uh, if Susan, do you conduct data sharing with your program administration in order to identify those individuals who should be served by the tribe? Um, what we do is if an application comes in and the um, applicant has checked that they're Alaska Native or American Indian and they're in one of the communities that we serve, we automatically send the application to the tribe. If it is a mixed household, then we will um, email back and forth or call back and forth between the tribe, but we don't have uh, something automatic in place where we can check each other's systems. Great, thank you. Uh, this is Cassandra again from the ADA. Uh, I have now brought up a, a slide with a little bit more information where you can find more information. The clearinghouse, the Lahit clearinghouse site has some examples of state tribal agreements, and they also have a section on state tribe agreements uh, as part of the tribal manual. If you go to that link, which is actually not live on this webinar, um, and go to page five, tribe state agreements is right there. 
Um, in addition, some examples of state tribe agreements are available for download right now. If you go to the top right corner of your screen to the uh, image of three pieces of paper, that'll be handouts. And from there, you can download an example of a state tribe agreement from Lumbee, an example of a state tribe agreement from Alaska, and then also the uh, feedback form for the webinar. And if you could please fill that feedback form out and get it to us uh, by June 1st so that we can know what we're doing right, know what we're doing wrong, and in, uh, get better. And uh, there's one more thing really quickly. We have two more webinars coming up, uh, both of them after the <coughs> in uh, June. The first one is going to be on Wednesday, July 31st, and the second one is going to be on Wednesday, September 18th, and both of those the topics are still being discussed, so if you have any topic recommendations, please let us know. Okay, thanks, Sandra. We, we do have another question on the audio. Sure, go ahead. Kathy Sakar, your line is open. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kathy Sakar. I work with the village of Crooked Creek, Alaska. And my question is, uh, in the past few years, we have um, our lahib's been going to a tribal organization from the state, and uh, the people that applied for the lahib program has been having difficulties getting their lahib assistance. Uh, I've talked with several people already, and right now I'm tra talking with the Crooked Creek Tribal Council about getting our own LAHI program. Uh, if I could get all the uh, meetings that were covered here, I mean there, uh, because I couldn't get online, there's some difficulties going on with our internet. Uh, my question is, how do we find out who's? Because uh, in the past few years, the tribal members have applied for LIHE but hasn't received anything until they get like shut off notices on their electricity or have no heat at all. How do we find out what percentage for Crooked Creek is allocated to the tribe? I can answer that one. Um, I've actually spoken to several people from Crooked Creek about this, and obviously you're not one of the individuals that I've spoken to. But um, Crooked Creek is administered by one of our tribal organizations. So we will have to work with the tribal organization to figure out what your percentage would be. It would be a percentage of their percentage. Um, they get a percentage based upon your community. Until the data download is done in 2013, I will not have updated percentages. Um, and as I had mentioned to several people from the tribe I've spoken with, the tribe has the option of coming on board and administering their own program or coming back to the state of Alaska or continuing to stay on board with the tribal organization that you're currently administering with. But I have been in contact with people from Crooked Creek, and they're more than welcome to contact me again. Um, and we will have to work with the tribal organization that you're currently being served by. All right. This is Susan Marshall. I was the one talking to you uh, a few weeks ago. Okay, I think we should probably take this individual circumstance offline, considering this is a specific situation and not the whole United States needs to hear this. Um, if you would like to give me a call in my office, I'd be more than happy to discuss it further with you. I'd also like to point out that if Crooked uh, Creek is a state or a federally recognized tribe, then it, you know, it certainly could come in as a separate grantee, and then its allocation would be based on uh, the uh, the share of its uh, uh, centennial census tribal house sorry centennial census tribal eligible households uh, to Alaska's eligible households or if they can document an amount in the absence of the centennial census then we based on that share and that's of course that if it if it comes in with a, a complete plan 
Thank you. Hi. Uh, we have one more question online, and I think we're a little bit over time, so this is going to be our last question for the webinar. Um, you can submit additional questions uh, through email to either the presenters directly or to anybody with content information in the uh, presentations. The final question is uh, from Lacey. She says, we have two service areas. Can we be funded in both the state of Oklahoma and the state of, Te of Kansas? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, feel free to create it. Sure, they, they, they can be funded, uh, um, they can be funded through separate agreements, um, or even, uh, a separate, uh, household accounts for, for each of those service, service areas. I mean, it's, um, we say funding, Ian, it's really, it's a funny, the calculation of the funding stream goes through, uh, the state of, the state to which they have the service area. So go, the calculation of the funding you know, go through Oklahoma and through Kansas. But again, like with the previous, like with the, the previous uh, caller, uh, it would have, it would have to be for a tribe that uh, is fair, federally recognized, and comes in with a complete plan. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers today for their thoughtful presentations, as well as our audience for participating in today's webinar. Uh, lastly, again, the webinar slides will be posted on the HHS ACF website. Thanks. I look forward to um, hopefully your participation in our next webinar. That concludes today's conference call. All lines may disconnect. Once again, that concludes today's conference call. All lines may disconnect. All right, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your help. Would you like to be placed into a post-conference?